Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. And this has actually been a fantastic meeting. And I say that sincerely. It's changed what I'm going to do when I go out of the room. And I didn't expect that. So thank you all. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you an idea about content mining. This is a very, very big upcoming topic. And it's going to engage all of you. Uh, just a, a bit about me. I'm w also with the Open Knowledge Foundation. That's this logo here. Um, and I'll refer occasionally uh, to this. Um, I've just started a project called The Content Mine. I've launched it last week. Uh, it's a project to extract uh, 100 million facts from the scientific scholarly literature uh, and produce them all um, uh, using machines, uh, and it's going to automate it. So uh, on the top, um, you probably, uh, yeah, you can probably just see this thing flitting around. Um, on the top, this is how humans used to mine things. It's hard work. Sometimes it's necessary, but this is how we extract things nowadays using machines and automating. So everything here is uh, CC BY or CC0. Uh, as I said, I'm on the advisory board of Science Commons, uh, and I would like to congratulate uh, CC before I joined it on the enormous value that CC licenses have. And despite what you've heard today, I would say always insist on CC licenses. People understand them. They do what is right, uh, and they are usable in any circumstance. Open we hear a lot of. The Open Knowledge Foundation uh, is uh, promoting open knowledge and making it useful. And the key phrase is free to use, reuse, and redistribute. And there's a lot of um, prior uh, work in that, particularly from the software area, uh, BSD, GPL, Apache, but also open government license, uh, public domain dedication license, things of that sort. So, a large number of organizations are espousing full openness. And again, I'm on the OKF's uh, Open Definition Advisory Board. And we get Open Canada coming in saying, is our license open, and, and so forth. CCNC and CCND are not Open Definition de uh, compliant. Um, Three years ago, uh, we were concerned about open data in science, and we came out with a set of principles based on the Panton Arms in uh, Cambridge, uh, which happens to be just by the chemistry department where I work and uh, just where Rufus Pollock, who is uh, the founder of the Open Knowledge Foundation, is. You'll also see Cameron Nalen, John Wilbanks, uh, Jenny Malloy, uh, and so on. So the summary of my talk is that content mining is technically straightforward. This laptop, I can run, uh, and if I ran it all day and all night, I could download the whole scientific literature, and I could turn it into semantic science. That is technically feasible. I can't do 100% with 100% accuracy now, but in a year's time, I and my friends will be able to do it. And the only thing stopping me uh, is uh, the legal aspects of that. Everything else uh, is possible. Being in Cambridge, I, uh, my university subscribes to most of what people want, so I can technically do it. Uh, if you get bored, there are three questions for, uh, two questions for you to answer. Who are the most important open access publishers and uh, repositories? And I'll answer that at the end if you're still interested. OK, so text and data mining is the use of machines to read and understand massive amounts of documents. And this is the point. Some graduate students will read several hundred papers a day, right? Uh, because they'll spend 10, 15 seconds on each to see whether it's worth reading. Machines uh, will read 10,000 documents a day and decide whether they're uh, worth reading. And we have asserted that if you have the right to read it, uh, then you have the right to mine it. Uh, this is taken from the right to roam um, uh, many years ago in this country. And I am absolutely delighted that the STM publishers yesterday have uh, agreed uh, on this principle in general. I have yet to see the small print. But um, on the assumption that's true, uh, that is a massive, massive step forward. And uh, it means that many of the tensions, which may still be apparent in my talk, uh, uh, start to melt away. It is important. If we do not have openness, uh, we lose the ability to make the right decisions at the right time with the right speed, and we fail to generate new wealth and new businesses. Who knows who this is? No? It's Aaron Schwartz. Aaron Schwartz downloaded JSTOR. 
Uh, and the US government uh, was trying to put him in jail for 30 years for downloading JSTOR. And he committed suicide. Whether the two are connected, we don't know. But he is one of my heroes um, in that he has pioneered openness in the internet. He was a brilliant um, uh, technical person, but also had great political vision. And Amy, whom you'll meet later, her baby is called Aaron. Right, so I'm going to show you uh, two papers, see what they look like. I don't know that this, this is, no, okay. They're on my machine somewhere. This is, um, sorry. Uh, okay, somewhere here are two papers. I thought you should see a paper because some of you, I suspect, don't actually see scientific papers. Uh, so this is um, a typical astronomy paper uh, and it is pretty dense stuff, right? Look at this. And that is actually, I think, uh, an appalling indictment of scientific publishing. No other industry in the modern world would tolerate communication of this sort. That is just bad communication. Um, if there are equations in it, the equations should be in mathematical form, uh, not in uh, PDF. Uh, and if there are facts in here, they should be in facts and in a database and the rest of it. And that's what we plan to do. So we plan to take this stuff. Now, that stuff is OK because it's in archive. The quality of stuff on archive technically is quite good. When it goes into an STM publisher, they destroy any technical quality. The quality coming out of STM publishers from the point of view of the PDF is awful. They don't use Unicode. They garble it. It's terrible. It's worse than government, far worse than government. Government makes a good deal of this. So a paper's got things like graphs in. It's got equations. I'm going to point that graph because we're going to see that one later. But that's a typical presentation of, sorry, uh, typical presentation of information. And it's the wrong way to do it because that is data. Uh, and we'll see later, there are actually uh, 2,000 data points in that diagram. And we should have the data points. Right, OK. Let's have a look at the other one. Uh, kill. Um, where is it? Here we are. Um, so are any of you uh, ornithologists? Good. OK. Uh, so uh, we'll come down here. Uh, there, that says sternus. Do you know what a sternus is? It's a starling. Uh, I used to be an orth ornithologist. Hirundo is a swallow. Paris is a tit. So this is how biologists speak. It's not difficult. You know, it's actually in um, you know, my bird handbook, all these Latin names and so on. That is a phylogenetic tree. That uh, is a hypothesis as to how all these species uh, speciated. Start here with some uh, bird millions of years ago, and it speciates into all these ones here. And um, that costs probably $10,000 to create because it's computed very carefully. There are 10,000 of them in the literature uh, that um, Therefore, that's 100, 000, 100 million pounds, right? And of that data, 4% is saved. And the rest is printed like this, which is useless for recomputation until we came along. And I will show you that we can actually uh, extract data from that uh, with total recovery. And that's why it's so important. So it matters. Uh, here is um, uh, one, another of my heroes, uh, Nelly Cruz. If I've got the, we've heard her, and she is brilliant. Uh, she says, I'm 72, and I do this uh, because I want to, not because I have to. She's leading the digital charge in Europe, the charge for openness. Uh, and um, uh, she goes and sleeps in sleeping bags uh, in bar camps in Spain. So do I. Uh, right. <laughs> Content mining, why? <laughs> Here are some things. To make it discoverable, we do not have a Google for science. We cannot search for a starling which is between 10 and 15 <laughs> centimeters long. We just can't do it. I can do it if you will let me and my friends uh, prepare the search engine for you. We want to extract facts for research, like those birds. We want to build reusable objects for all sorts of things, for teaching. Uh, we want to have a reusable climate model so that we can actually predict whether we're all going to die. Um, we want to uh, create, aggregate material. Create new businesses. 
Europe, uh, or even this country, would be 500 million uh, quid better off per year if we were able to use um, open access data uh, for this. And you've heard that already. And you can check this for better science. So these are some of my facts here. I don't, I estimate 300 billion spent each year on science and medicine. I don't know whether that's true, but it's in the order of 100 billion uh, to 1,000 million, somewhere in the middle. Sorry, wrong button. Okay. Now, some of these are moderated, but uh, they're still there. Some of the problems with content mining, and they're all um, uh, legal problems or contractual problems, none of them are technical problems. Uh, and if Cameron uh, Nayland had talked to you, he's got four uh, pieces of FUD uh, about why content mining can't happen. Um, and there are things like it will burn our servers out. And you should listen to Cameron on that one. Uh, what I do is 10 to the minus 7 of the load on a publisher, right? Something of that sort. And the bottom one, which I'm quite proud of, is that Peter Murray Rust, that's me, uh, will download and publish all our content. Well, I'm not going to. I'm going to download and analyze and publish factual data, which is not copyrighted. OK, so these are the problems. I have had the University of Cambridge cut off for doing something which was quite legal and actually within the contracts. Um, and until today, I believe that the publisher was lobbying uh, the EC to restrict content mining. And it sounds as if there's been a Damascene conversion. And they are actually now saying, as we've heard um, uh, today uh, from Taylor and Francis, that they actually are quite happy for us to do it. And that is just so fantastic. Uh, I want to dance down Piccadilly. Um, so. I'll say something about wall gardens. There are a huge number of wall gardens around. A wall garden is when you're able to get something, but not everything. They are free, but not open. Free as in beer, but not free as in freedom. Uh, and a service provider has control, ultimately, uh, over the application's content and median. It is very, very dangerous if you start off getting locked into something that ends up as a walled garden. Because you will find that they possess stuff uh, that you are not able to work with. And the example I'm going to use, and I know Ian is here in the audience, is that half of the crystallographic data that is published uh, is locked up in the Cambridge Data Center walled garden. Now, walled garden is an accurate term. That is Wikipedia's definition. The Guardian picked it up uh, a year ago. Why here? And you can see 200 billion for Europe if we're allowed to do it. This is what we went through the last year, licenses for Europe, which, as I say, I hope I can uh, tear up. Um, but a uh, number of uh, groups here, BL, JISC, RLUK, Open Knowledge Foundation and us personally walked out of this because it was going to tie us down to something which was totally, <coughs> totally unworkable. So, and I have said licensing um, uh, text and data mining is like, go back, uh, is like publishers taxing spectacles because they make it easier to read. So here's Amy with her spectacles. Right. I am uh, credited, it's not my phrase, of saying that uh, it is impossible to turn a hamburger into a cow and turning X, uh, PDF into XML uh, is similar. Well, I didn't actually say it, I borrowed it. Um, but I can't turn a hamburger into a cow, but we can now, and I, this is the first public announcement, turn PDFs into science. We can take that PDF, whether it's a thesis, whether it's a, a scholarly publication, and we can turn it into high quality science. I don't have enough time to show you that it's interactively working. You'll have to trust me on that. And we can't do it for every publisher and every bit of science. But in a year's time, we will, because we will build a community which is doing that. So that's taking this diagram here and turning it into a CSV file. And once you've got a CSV file, you can do all sorts of exciting things here. So this is just showing it. We, uh, my software, that's Amy. Amy is the software, right? Uh, and Amy will select that without any manual intervention. Uh, she will then find out what's on the axes. Note the, uh, how many of you can read those units on the left-hand side? Read the units. You've all had to put, right, 
Is that a modern way to access information, that you have to turn your heads 90 degrees to read the bloody thing? Right. And some of them, the things are printed upside down in supplemental information. I mean, let's get real. We're in the electronic age, not the paper age, OK? Uh, so we take this PDF, we extract it into a CSV, and any physicist or maths or numeric scientist here will know that we can do things like Gaussian filter, which tells you what the average curve is, and second derivative, which tells you uh, where the peaks are. Uh, and that is all done automatically, and it takes about uh, 20 milliseconds uh, to do that. So we can take the whole of that dumb literature, uh, this is not vaporware, uh, and turn it into reproducible physical science. So just to give you an idea, uh, here's a BMC. Now, um, uh, that's in PDF. We can turn it into HTML. HTML is semantic, PDF is not. And notice that we've got all the little circles on top of things, the diacritics and the subscripts. And we lose nothing because Amy is, uh, uh, her, I put a lot of work into Amy to get this right. So it does not lose anything in this. Uh, those uh, of you ornithologists, we can pull all the species out. So we can go through this paper and we get something like, uh, 120 species out, and they're all correct. Uh, there are probably something like um, 10 million men mentions of species in the literature each year. There may be more. We haven't done it. But we're going to go over the whole literature starting today and extracting all the species because now we're allowed to. And that is fantastic. So you will have a species index of the literature. You go to Google and type this in. You might get it. You might not. And you can only get one paper. By doing this, any of you who run institutional repositories, we can index all your theses for, uh, for, for species, and it will take approximately, um, I would think, something of the order of, we heard 5,000 theses, I would think it probably take, um, we could probably do that in two days, something of that sort, running on a laptop. That's it. You would then have, you'd be able to search that repository by species, which would actually mean it would be useful, whereas at the moment, I'm afraid repositories are no use to me, whatever, if they were searchable. That's just showing you that you probably can't read what's in there, but the machine can. The machine can read to three decimal places of a pixel, because that's actually what's inside this. Uh, and we can extract it into semantic form. And we can do this at all sorts of levels. So this is pulling nuggets out of uh, a bit of paper. This isn't much fun to read, is it? That's a terrible way to, uh, to present things. But the machine can go through and pull out all these things uh, that, that we want. They can find place names. So you see it's, uh, it's linked here. And what I'm going to give you a little demo here, if I'm lucky. Uh, this demo uh, is real. It's running in real time. Here's a bit of uh, paper, uh, and we could do this with five million of these chemicals. That's a chemical recipe. You can see we made this. It's like making cakes only with chemicals, right? Uh, and um, uh, we could do that. And the only thing stopping me from doing it with the ACS content is the ACS lawyers, and the ACS is run by a lawyer, right? Uh, OK, so we'll ask uh, our server to process it. Bam. It sent it to Cambridge and back. It, this is not pre-canned. Uh, and you can see that it's actually worked out what that compound is on the fly. Every compound here, it knows it. It's worked it out. It didn't look it up. It worked it out. And this one here, which is half a line long, worked that one out as well. So we've got an intelligent machine that understands the scientific literature. And we should actually all rejoice about that because I think it's um, uh, going to completely change the way we think about things. So back to this. Um, I, I didn't know whether I was going to be able to present from the internet or not, so you'll probably find uh, that we skip over one or two things here. Uh, yeah, so this is just telling you what you've seen. We can look up things like that. We can look up dissolve, uh, the compounds, etc. Right. Now, this thing is called a spectrum, right? Uh, every compound has a spectrum. You put it in something uh, and shine radiation at it, and it might be infrared, it might be ultra ultraviolet, or it might be uh, NMR microwave. It doesn't matter what it is. But the spectrum is a fingerprint. It's characteristic of every compound. Every compound's different, right? So here's a compound. Uh, now, 
perfectly good compound. Uh, these two peaks up here correspond to this bit of the molecule. These ones down here correspond to that bit. And they've put it in as a, a proof of concept. They said, this is the spectrum we expect. This is the spectrum we get. Therefore, we've made this compound. Five million of those done a year, right. But you give it to Amy. Can you see something different there? What can you see? Can you see the square in the middle? Well, there's no square in the spectrum. Squ spectra don't have squares. So we ask Amy, what's that square doing? Take it away. And Amy says, it's a white square which has been put in by the author to hide something they didn't want. It's scientific fraud. Now, I didn't discover this. Uh, it was in uh, an American Chemical Society paper. The referees didn't spot it. Why should they? They're only humans. They're not machines. Machines can spot it. My software could go over the whole of the scientific chemical literature and spot stuff like that. And if you want it spotted, then you should. And if you're running a journal which contains any scientific information that's checkable, then you should be actively looking to run this over it rather than resisting it. Um, there you are. They were detected. I raised some peaks without telling anybody. Right. Okay. So, what are we going to do about it? Well, we can try the political uh, level, and I have. Uh, we can try the technical level, and we can try the social level. All of this to liberate data. Now we have a, a concern here about crystallography. As I said, half the crystallography is in a walled garden, right? And you can see here the data sets. Now those data sets are actually created by the scientists, and then they are given to the publisher or to the Cambridge Data Centre, and they are held in a walled garden. And I can't get them except for two or three at a time, certainly not the tens of thousands that I want. And you'll see they're used for bona fide research purposes only. They may contain copyright material. Well, the only copyright thing in there is the CCDC identifier. Everything else was created by the scientific author. I cannot check whether that data is... Uh, correct. So we have a monopoly walled garden here, and what some of us are doing is coming up with a different way. So there are two ways forward. There's um, the crystallography open database, which is 10 years old, where we collect it um, from uh, the literature and from other people, and uh, uh, this is now up to a quarter of a million compounds. That's actually enough for most people. You don't need to be comprehensive to do uh, many of the things that we want. And our own initiative, uh, this was built by a very bright graduate student, uh, Nick Day, in his third year. Uh, in the third year, graduate students are both creative and often bloody-minded, and he was both. Um, and he built this, a complete database to manage the lit literature. And if I'm lucky, I can connect to the internet again, uh, and you will see this. Um, so here it is. Uh, let's browse the issue. So we're now browsing it in a traditional way. Uh, um, here we go. And Java has fun, and so we have to twiddle our fingers. But it has come up with the molecule, and it's come up with a three-dimensional molecule simply from reading the data in the paper. Uh, and we've done for thousands of them, and just to show, oh, sorry, quarter of a million, we can go off and we can actually find the paper. So we have data linked to the paper. We have a complete semantic uh, publication object. And that's what we should be doing uh, in the 21st century. That's the end of the demonstrations, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. We're on track. We've been over this, right? So I've launched the content mine. Um, I've put in for something called a Shuttleworth Foundation Fellowship. Shuttleworth, Mark Shuttleworth developed Ubuntu, the operating system. Uh, he's passionate about openness, and he's made a, a considerable amount of money, and he's put some of this back into a charitable foundation uh, to fund people who want to use information technology and openness to change the world. Uh, and um, I've applied for this, and I have an interview in a week's time, uh, on Skype, of course, uh, and I'm pulling together the plan to do it. So the plan is on my blog, um, and um, 
Let's go back to Psalm. Developed Amy. Amy is 10 years work. It's 100,000 lines of open code. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, the part of this is then to promote this for extracting facts from the literature. There will be a day 10, 20 years down when we don't need Amy, where everything will be published semantically. But at the moment, we need to go through this uh, horrible business of turning PDFs back into XML. We have friends. So outside the academic community, here's uh, a guy. He describes himself as troll. He works for, anyone heard of ProPublica? No. Well, ProPublica is a, 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 a new, um, you know, a new wave uh, digital democracy uh, publisher in New York. And he works with an Argentinian, and they've developed Tabula, which is an open PDF extractor. And the point of that is they need it for data journalism. So there are people out there who are doing complementary things who for completely different reasons, are developing the same sort of tool set as we want. And I was delighted to hear about the uh, open tool set uh, because I think that that's the sort of thing I will contribute all my software uh, to the open uh, tool set. Here are some of the people. I put together a little video. If you've got five minutes, you can download the video. It's on the, on the slides here in my blog. And uh, I put together some of the people we will engage with, uh, some of the uh, events we might go to, uh, some of the organizations, the publishers, uh, and um, companies, and so on. So lots of people to see. And the idea is to come up, uh, the model at the moment is to build boot camps. Uh, so. Here's a picture of a boot camp. Uh, and our first boot camp uh, is at Oxford, uh, week after Ness, run by Jenny Malloy. And before she had announced it, it was full out. They want, people desperately want to know about content mining, how to do it. And these boot camps will be self-replicating. So the people who do this will go out and spread up other boot camps. And that's the model. So the thing will spread like wildfire. That's been done with Greg Wilson and Software Carpentry, and you'll see him on my um, video. So these are some of the people I've talked with. This doesn't mean that they approve, uh, but I have talked with them. Uh, I'm going to see PLOS tomorrow. Um, I'm, uh, you know, uh, I've got arrangements to see a number of people, uh, and many of these people will fall in with this uh, idea. So. This is my last slide. Uh, the right to read is the right to mine. If you take nothing else away, that's probably the single most thing uh, from this. Uh, if you're a library, reject any restrictions on text and data mining. Now, that may not be necessary after today's announcement, but if you get a contract that says people may not text and data mine, tear it up. You've been signing rights away for the last, I don't know, six years or more, uh, I'm asking how many years by issuing several FOIs to Russell Group Universities, and we'll see what happens. Publishers, I, would, I put this before you had it, Damascene conversion, please. You've had it. Wonderful. I think that's it. <laughs>